fear through Killarney. Now I'm back to hitching with the wind. But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me, I'll throw me caution all behind me and swear I'll fall on that son of a bitch again. He cracked a bit a rib or two, he beat me suddenly through and through. And so she over my unconscious frame. Dumb and lame. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Chase and the Pennant Podcast. I'm your host, Rob, joined tonight by Andrew. We're recording on a good note because the Phillies have just beaten the Braves 7-6, to avoiding the sweep with a controversial run scored in the top half of the ninth inning. Andrew, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good after that win. <laughs> Tough uh, first two games, but glad they were able to get one to salvage the series, whether it's controversial or not. I will take the win. A win's a win in my book. And uh, as long as we're on the right end of that that call, uh, I'm, I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah, so for those who did not see it, uh, sack fly in the top half of the ninth inning. Alec Boom comes in to, in to score the go-ahead run, and it was a play at the plate. Ozuna with his rag arm that he has did not make a great throw, but looking at all the different angles on replay, it definitely looks like Alec Boehm definitely did not get his foot in there at home plate. I'm maintaining that he barely nicked it by like one millionth of an inch with with his uh, the outside of his left big toe, but it, yeah, it, to the naked eye, it looks like he definitely did not get that foot in there, and it should have been an ending-ending double play sending it to the bottom of the ninth at 6-6. But the umpires reviewed it. The call was upheld. He was safe. Phillies, 7-6 to six win. Salvaging a game, the third game of the series, after losing the first two. First game of the series, not so great. Jumped out to a one nothing lead and then gave up eight runs unanswered. That game was kind of over pretty early. And then last night, the 5-4 to four loss, a game that was kind of Back and forth a little bit. You could argue the Phillies probably should have won that game. Uh, Bryce Harper finally getting on the board with the home run in that one. Had another one tonight, a big one at that. And the Phillies, as I said, getting the 7-6 to six win to avoid the sweep. And we were talking about it a little bit in the group chat just a minute ago. But how big is it for the Phillies to get this win tonight and maintain their position in first place early on in the season? It's huge. Uh, obviously, we, you know, we go in here and expected a, a, a big season between a lot of these teams in the division. You're going to be battling to the end from game one to, to game 162 this year. And that's just the way it's going to be when you have uh, four great teams in this division with who knows how it's going to play out. And, and you open up the season with three against the Braves, three against the Mets, another three against the Braves and then four against the Mets. It's important to take these division games because not only do you want to get off to a good start then, but you're not going to have these division games late in the season like you usually do one and then two. Obviously, when it comes down to tiebreakers, it's going to come down to a lot of these division games. And obviously, you still have a lot more against these teams. But that, that's why uh, this, this opening of the season has been so big for this Phillies team. And instead of getting swept in the evening in that season series against the Braves at 3-3, you get this one and not only uh, up your lead the two games in the division, but now you're two up on the Braves as well if it does come down to that. So I think that's one reason why it's huge, too. And then... And then on on top of that, it, I'm sure you would agree with me, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, today would have been a game that you would probably lose last year. I think you could say that for a couple of games so far in the start of the year. And I think you put it in our group chat, too. It's just big for their mentality. Like, they can know that they're going to go out there and win these games now. And even though it's just early on in the season, it's still big for their mind for their mind and the way they're going to approach the game and everything. And they realize, okay, we're actually going out and winning these one-run games this year compared to last year where we were losing a lot of them. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a big difference between, you know, being able to win this game and the way that they were losing it last year. And the difference is the bullpen. I mean, Matt Moore, another shaky start tonight. He kind of settled down a little bit after that rough first inning and um, ended up giving up five earned and in five innings. But the bullpen, they came in, they pitched four innings. They only gave up the one run, which was given up by uh, Sam Coonrod. Other than that. Connor Brogdon, a perf- perfect inning. Alvarado uh, had a walk. He's a little bit wild, but he got out of it. You know, he made it interesting, but he got out of it. And then a perfect bottom half of the ninth for Hector Neris nailing down the save. And that's been the difference in a few of these games so far early on. Uh, they've had some games that 
could have possibly gotten away from them. I know Matt Moore's first start with the Phillies was, was definitely one of them. And both times the bullpen just came in. They saved the day. They kept the, um, kept the opposition from running away with the game and the Phillies were able to come back and win. So the big difference is the bullpen. It's really proving to be that way early on the season. I know they had a rough game last night, ended up blowing that one. But aside from that, they've been excellent so far this season. It's, it's really refreshing to see because it's been so long since we've had a good bullpen. So it's, it's such a huge difference maker. I mean, the Phillies, I think they had the lead uh, and the second most games in the NL last year behind the Dodgers, if I remember correctly. And yet they finished with a losing record and they missed the playoffs because the bullpen was historically bad. So if you can even have an average bullpen with the amount of the talent that they have offensively, that's going to be a huge difference. And right now it's looking like they have better than that. They have an above average bullpen and we're still awaiting, I guess, like a full prognosis on the, um, the seriousness of Archie Bradley's injury, hopefully that's not too bad. He went on the 10-day injury list today, and hopefully it doesn't turn out to be a David Robertson situation where we think he's going to be short-term and ends up being forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, fingers crossed there that Archie Bradley can come back in 10 days fully healthy and able to help this team further. But other than that, you know, it's, it's been all good for the bullpen so far. Uh, what's your takeaway on the bullpen? Yeah, I think it's been big. I think, uh, like you mentioned, Jose Alvarado made it interesting here this or this evening. And I think that's what we're going to get out of him. I think his one thing is his command's not there, but when you're throwing 100, 102 miles per hour, you're going to be able to get away with some pitches. And uh, he definitely got away with a couple there, leaving a couple over the plate. But, again, that's just who he's going to be, and it's the way it's going to go with him. And I think, I think you've already seen it this year. Like you said, I mean, you had the worst bullpen in the league last year, so if you're able to just go from 30 to even 24, which I know that's not great, but you're going to get a lot more wins just going up. There's six spots there uh, in the rankings. So I think uh, all around, though, I mean, how about uh, Connor Brogdon just throwing tremendous so far? I mean, I know obviously there was a lot of hype of him coming into the year and then spring training he was pitching well but obviously spring training in the regular season is different but again only only a, a few games in here but he's been nothing short of fantastic though uh three wins already on the year as well and i think that goes to show too is how the bullpen is i mean he's got three wins alone out of the, out of the pen that might be more than our bullpen combined last year he's got <laughs> three and alvarado has got two so five out of their six wins so far by the bullpen the other one by zach wheeler so that's that's it, pretty crazy it, they, it shows they're winning a lot of games with the bullpen in the game, which is something that didn't happen last season. But going back to Alvarado and his wildness, I think, and this has been mentioned a few times with on Philly's telecast and on the radio and whatnot, that when you throw 100 miles an hour, being effectively wild can be a good thing. Because if you're a batter stepping up to the plate, stepping into the batter's box, and you know the guy throws 100 miles an hour, and you also know that sometimes he doesn't exactly know where it's going. That kind of puts a little bit of doubt in your mind, doesn't it? It kind of like, okay, this one could be coming right at my head or it could be over the heart of the middle of the plate. No, that's true. I never thought of it like that way. That's a good point. And you might see guys brush off the plate a little bit too. So that's an interesting point. Uh, no, but I, I see what you're saying. That's I, I never would have thought of that. I, something I'm going to pay attention to a little bit now, but... It's uh, it's something good to have because that's another thing that you've seen from this bullpen compared to last year is the velocity that these guys have. I mean, we didn't have anyone that could come in and throw, I think, even 97, 98 last year. I mean, with the uh, transient Dominguez being out for a while, obviously, you've kind of been short of that. Now you got a couple guys doing that as well. So it's it's been nothing but exciting so far in this uh, early going of the season. Hopefully it can last for uh, 162. Yeah, and uh, Alvarado, on the radio at least, he's been getting some – comparisons to Mitch Williams back in the early 90s of the Phillies kind of the same thing you know Mitch Williams he threw hard and some pitches were right over the plate he's painting the corners and others were behind the hitters back so and and that's what made him so effective is that you know you you step up to the plate as a hitter you don't know if you're gonna get drilled you don't know if you're gonna get chin music or you you might get you know a pitch that paints the corner so it kind of keeps keeps the hitters on edge a little bit and kind of makes them a little bit less comfortable in the batter's box. So I think that's a, a that's a big factor that it's kind of good to be effectively wild if you're uh, Alvarado. So hopefully he continue to be, can continue to 
be uh, be as effective throughout the course of the season. Hopefully his wildness doesn't doesn't get the best of him. But so far so good. And um, it's also good to see over the course of the past few games the Phillies bats getting back into it a little bit. Bryce Harper with homers and back to back games after going the first seven without going deep. Reese Hoskins and Didi Gregorius also with their second homers of the season, respectively. Uh, yesterday, McCutcheon getting on the board with a home run. And, you know, the, the last game of that Mets series, uh, they had the, the two three-run homers and also a solo shot in that one. So what do you make of the Phillies' bats kind of getting going a little bit after a bit of a slow start to the season? I think that's been very exciting as well. I think that's something, you know, Going through those first couple of games, I kept hearing, okay, they're finding ways to win. Obviously, the bats weren't going, but I mean, that's that's honestly the one I'm least worried about out of the two. So if that's the one that's going to take a little bit, fine by me. It's good to see the pitching kind of picking it up right now. I would say the last couple of games, having your your all star quote unquote all stars, you know, really starting to play well in the Harper two home runs. I think Biscuit mentioned in the chat, it's never been like he's been a real slump. He just hasn't had the power to this point. So having those the last two nights have been have been pretty big for this team. Uh, and then JT's been phenomenal at the, in the middle part of that lineup once again. Alec Bohm's starting to hit even better, and he's just been coming up clutch again <laughs> time after time, even for a young guy. I'd say the one spot I am a little concerned, and we had the home run yesterday, is McCutcheon. Um, you know, the 179 average early on kind of worries me a little bit, and obviously nothing's happening in center field right now as well. So that, that's the one spot I think uh, – continues to be a question just because it's the leadoff spot and that's the spot you kind of need to uh start going early and it's just not haven't seen that from a cutchin yet so i'm interested to see how long they let him go at the top of the order but the problem is i don't know who you're going to move there because you don't really have any other true leadoff hitter to put in that spot but overall i mean these guys are really starting to hit and that's i think the biggest thing for this lineup if we can see that compared to something we haven't really seen i feel like is these guys as good as these guys have been the last couple of years and even the start of this year they're never clicking at the same time and I think whatever can they can do to get on the same page at the same time is going to go a long way for this team just because again that's something I feel like we've never really seen is the true lineup clicking from from one to seven or eight whatever it is and, and that's something the last couple of days especially today you've kind of seen especially when you have uh two to two through seven uh all scoring a run and while yep. Al Bohm didn't get a hit, or excuse me, he didn't get a hit. So I think actually two through seven all got hits tonight. Outside of McCutcheon and Quinn were the two guys that didn't get a hit in, in tonight's game. So I think that goes to show it. And again, when they're clicking like that and that's going to happen, you're going to be putting up at least five runs a night. They did, yeah. Yeah, two through seven all did have hits tonight, and they all had runs scored as well. So, yeah, it's, it's good to see them all get going. Hart, um, Hoskins is off to a great start to the season. Harper... The power's coming along. The average is, is pretty decent right now. It could be a little bit better. Uh, Real Muto is hitting the ball very well to start the season. Uh, Bohm and Segura, the average isn't great right now, but I, I can only imagine with both of them that's going to go up as the season goes along, especially with Alec Bohm. He had a nice night, two for four tonight, had a ring double to a uh, right center field in the top half of the ninth inning that kind of got the ball rolling there. So that was a really big hit for him in a big situation. And that could be the kind of thing that mentally kind of gets him going a little bit. So good to see him getting on track. And then you have Didi Gregorius in that seventh spot. He's been excellent so far and had a huge three run Homer and also the, um, the sack fly, the controversial sack fly to put them ahead. <laughs> so it, it's good to see those guys get going. Yeah. You can only hope that McCutcheon, it gets that 179 average up a little bit. And then, yeah, you just have kind of a black hole out there in center field with Roman Quinn's 0 for 4 pushing his average down to 063 on the season, which is, I didn't even know that he had a hit. I, whenever he got a hit, I must have missed it. <laughs> yeah, I, I missed that one as well, too. I, I, when I was uh, looking at the box score, I was expecting to say zero as well. And now he's in uh, point where. Yeah, for the life of me, I can't remember uh, him getting a hit this season, but. Um, yeah, between him and Hazley, it's been a real struggle out there, not only offensively, but defensively as well. And it kind of begs the question, at what point do they look into either bringing uh, Mickey Moniak up or even Odubel Herrera? Do you think that they're already looking into that at this point? I think you have to be, in all honesty. I know it sounds like I'm jumping the gun with it being so early on in the year, obviously, with only nine games into the season. But, again, with how close this division is, I don't think you're going to have much room to error in these division games. And, again, I think you're going to be searching for spots in this lineup. Obviously, you're deep two to seven, but the problem is I don't think Quinn or Hazley's defense is 
that great to kind of pick up for them. You know, if they're not hitting, but they're fantastic defenders kind of going all out and everything, then you could make that leeway, you know, to, to leave them in the lineup. But I don't think their defense – I mean, we saw Hazley misplay a ball earlier. We all know Quinn's struggles coming in. The, I know he had, the, obviously, that big throw out at the play early on in the year, which saved the game at the time. But I think, again, obviously, overall, people would say he's an a- average defender probably at best. Uh, does he use that speed to his full ability? And if, when he's not getting on base, I mean, he's not going to be able to steal if he's not getting yeah. on base. So the, the, the speed kind of gets devalued at some point. Uh, so I think, again, it, I get nine games might be a little early, but for me, to for me, it's it's not going to be too early because if, if these guys are doing their job as, as in the front office, they're going to be looking at, at that as well. And the question is, the, the qu- real question is, though, is Herrera or Moniak really going to make that much of a difference? I, at this point, I don't know. I've never been a big Herrera guy. I know he's had the off-the-field stuff as well, but I'm not even talking about that. Just strictly on-the-field play, I've never been a huge fan of his. He's kind of been such an up-and-down player outside that one, kind of like Donald Brown, outside that one big streak where he had that on-base streak or whatever. I feel like he's never done a whole lot for, for the team, uh, hitting kind of low. So for me, I honestly want to... I want to, it's not too early for me to even start looking outside the organization uh, again because with McCutcheon struggles at the top of the order, and I've been saying I think this would be the best way, is if you can find, I don't know who it is yet, but if you could find a center fielder that would be a good leadoff hitter as well, that way you can move McCutcheon down in the lineup as well. I think that would bode well for him and the team as a whole. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and maybe it is time to kind of take a peek and do some due diligence outside the organization uh, as far as that center field spot goes and how it could affect where they put McCutcheon in the lineup as well. That's, that's a key thing. Um, I just, I, I'm done with Roman Quinn. I've been done with him for a while. I've been a defender of Hazley, so I always kind of want to give him a little bit more of a chance, but he's, you know, he's making me look bad. Like, come on, Adam, I've been, I've been saying good things about you for the past, you know, year or so on, on this podcast, and you're really making me look like shit right now. So don't appreciate that, dude. Come on, get your game together. Um, the, the thing with that, him real quick, I just think it's kind of – it's weird because he's a young player and obviously has a lot of time to turn it around. I just think when you're going to be – like if we were still in the rebuilding stages, it would be different. But now when you're going to be in the, the thick of a division race, we all assume and hope come by the end of the year, it's – your, your leeway is going to become less and less, and, and the time to wait for him to build around it is going to become, become less just because if we're in that race, you want to go all in to win now. So he's a piece you might add to a deal to kind of win now this year or within the next two years where it might be, where if you're kind of still on the upcoming rebuilding stage, you're going to be like, okay, yeah, we'll let this guy play every day, and we're going to let him develop into that player because you're not going for that division right now. So I think that's where it's a tough spot for him. I think he still has great potential and, and could be a starter in the, in the future for another team. But just like when you're in that division race, how much leeway do you give him? And that's what's that's yeah. what the tricky part is. That's why I'm in this spot. I'm happy I'm not in the front office making that decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, it's kind of similar to the situation the Phillies had. I think it was really with their bullpen kind of in the 2006, 2007 area where they had some young guys in the bullpen. And they needed to replace them with veteran arms to make that run in 2008. Uh, it's kind of the same situation with center field right now where you got – a young player who has some upside and is maybe kind of starting to plant a little bit of a seed of doubt as to whether or not he'll reach that upside, but you're in a win now mood. So you've got to go out and you've got to fill that center field position with a guy who can at least, his, at least hold his own defensively and offensively, you know, maybe not a, an all-star level player, maybe not a guy who's going to be a game breaker either on the offensive or defensive side of things, but someone who's at least adequate, someone who's not going to be a black hole in the lineup or a big burden uh, covering all that ground defensively. So you could look to potentially see a move made there. I would like to see them give Moniak a shot. I've been critical of him throughout the course of his career, but you know, he was a number one overall pick and, Sometimes it takes those guys, especially when you're number one pick out of high school at 18 years yeah. old. Sometimes it kind of takes a little bit to get into the swing of things at the professional level. Um, I would like to see them give him a shot and see what he can do, see if he can improve over what we saw from him last season. I think that he has the tools. I just, you know, maybe he just he needs that one chance to kind of go out there and prove himself. So. Maybe within the next couple of weeks or so, if things don't improve between Hazley and Moniak, I'd like to see a move made there. And I'm with you. 
I really kind of don't want Herrera back, not just because of, of the off the field stuff, but also because ever since that all-star appearance that he made and then that hot start that he had to the season, what was it, in 2017, I believe? Yeah, yeah. Some, somewhere around there. And then he, he really cooled off after that, and he hasn't been quite the same. Um, I'm not real keen on having a Dubal Herrera out in center field, but I would like to see uh, Mickey Moniak at least get a little bit of a chance to kind of try and prove themselves before they decide on uh, whether or not they need to go in with a big trade to fill that position there. Absolutely, and that's to your point. I think the Hazley and I mean, obviously Moniak not being caught up yet, so I'm to call it that, but I think this situation compares a little bit to, to the arms you were saying back in those days with Vance Worley and Jay Happ. Like, they obviously showed potential at the time, but you're in the middle of the division races, so I think they I think Happ was part of the Royal Oswald trade. Uh, yes. Correct if I'm wrong. So, obviously, and that's Worley why, was a little bit. Worley was a couple of years after that. Yeah. So, I think, so again, I think that, that was just a spot where you felt that the veteran there would be a better piece in the division slash World Series race, and that's the question they're going to have to ask themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's a big position, too, because it's the centerpiece of the outfield. You know, you need that position to at least be adequate defensively. And if you can get a guy who can get on base, as you said, you can kind of move McCutch now that leadoff spot there and uh, do some things with the lineup, kind of toy around with that a little bit and hopefully put Kutch in a spot where he can be a little bit more successful. You know, Kutch being the veteran player that he is, I trust that he's going to at least mentally get himself out of this and be, you know, a fairly decent ball player. I don't trust Absolutely. him to be hitting 179 throughout the course of the season, but it just, it's becoming obvious that he's, he's not the guy for the leadoff spot. You know, he doesn't have the speed that he used to have and he's not getting on base the way he used to. So if they could find another option for that spot there and move him down towards the bottom of the order, um, I think that could be hugely beneficial offensively. Yes. 100% agree. All right, so the Phillies uh, finished up their three-game series down in Atlanta, moving on to uh, Queens, New York, to take on the Mets. And this is a four-game series. It'll be um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And wrapping up this whole Braves-Mets, Braves-Mets thing, they've had success for, so far, 6-3 and three in their first nine games against those two squads. And how big do you think it will be for this team, at least from an emotional standpoint, to go up to New York and at least gain a split in this series and end this, uh, end this little thing between the Braves and the Mets with, you know, eight or nine wins? How, how big do you think that would be uh, to them from an emotional standpoint? I think it'd be huge. I remember when we, you know, we were doing the the preview for the season show, and I was talking about, you know, you find a way to get out of these first four series with around a 500 record, just playing good close baseball with these teams. So if you're able to find a way to win two, get out of this, uh, get out of this opening stretch, difficult stretch with an eight and five record, I think a lot of people would take that. I mean, it's going to still be in the lead, and I think that's the big thing. Now you did your job in those first series, and we're able to take take both obviously sweeping the Braves and then winning the um, first Mets one two out of three so I think at this point you just got to do what you got to do to stay in front and obviously that a lot still going on in the year but my point is you just got to play 500 ball at those teams now you stay two and two you're going to keep that tiebreaker uh and obviously the goal was obviously to get three or four out of the series I'm not saying only take two but obviously just stay in front and that's what it's going to be able to do and obviously the Mets have a fantastic team and I'm sure yeah, DeGrom pitched yesterday, so we obviously faced DeGrom again in a four-game series, and we all know what happened last time. But that's what you have to do, just find a way to knock those guys out of the game because their star is going to be good. But just like just like the Phillies and a lot of the NL East teams, the bull, I don't know if there's any bullpen in this division that we could call uh, lights out or lo- a lockdown bullpen. I, I think that's the key. Is these teams are filled with starting pitching. If you can get to the pen early on uh, mid-game, I think you, you'll put yourself in position to win. So if you're able to go up here – take two it's big for your emotional standpoint big for the record but uh and not only that obviously division's been a spot i feel like the phillies have struggled a little bit in, in recent uh years so i think that's another key here just get again get that winning feeling back in the clubhouse and get these guys believing in themselves because i feel like they've kind of lacked that a little bit in the last couple of years you know i think they've got a big opportunity in this series here because they got chase anderson going uh, tomorrow night, but then after that, it's Nola, it's Wheeler, it's Eflin. So you got your three best pitchers for the final three games of the series. And I think that uh, you said that the ground pitched yesterday, correct? Yeah, he threw Saturday. 
So I, I think that would put him in line to start at the afternoon game on Thursday, which would be yeah. up against Zach Eflin, which would be a pretty pretty decent. I mean, obviously, any matchup that DeGrom is in is going to favor the Mets. But I think Zach Eflin, if he pitches like he did his first time out instead of uh, what he did the other day, you know, that's, that's a game that the Phillies could easily win right there. And um, DeGrom's one of those pitchers who he's so good, but – the Mets never get him any yeah. run support, as, <laughs> as proven the last time that we played them. I think they scored two runs. It was a 2 nothing game by the time that DeGrom came out, and then the Phillies teed off on their bullpen in the eighth inning in that one. And just um, the, the Mets' bullpen has, has given them some problems so far this season. So if you go into that game against DeGrom, you can at least get adequate starting pitching and you know get them – the pitching to keep them in the game until you can knock him out. I think they could do some damage against the bullpen the way that they did the first time. So it's um I I see this up this series as an opportunity for the Phillies to a really make a statement and b kind of you know maybe maybe uh take three games in the series and kind of put a little bit of breathing early breathing room if you will uh, between themselves and some of the other other clubs and really get themselves feeling good that they can beat what's supposed to be the top two teams in the division. So I see this as, a, as an early opportunity for the Phillies, especially if they can keep the offense going the way that they were able to uh, in the um, in the Brave series. Yeah, I think you used a great word. Go out there and make a statement. And I think that's a perfectly well put uh, sentence because I think if you go out and find a way to take three, you're absolutely doing that. You know, you go you go in there, beat the Mets in their place three out of four, and then for the year it would be five out of, out of uh, seven to that point. So I think you go in there, you do that. And I'm interested to see what the Mets do. They did have, I don't know if you saw this weird situation today, but they I think they threw like two batters. They tried to – like forced the game to be played today. And I think Marcus Stroman threw it to two hitters today and then they suspended the game. So a very odd situation out there, probably poorly handled by the MLB, but I'm curious. I mean, two batters is two batters. So I'm interested to see if they shift their kind of rotation around a little bit and try to have Stroman go against us in the series, obviously with a big situation or if they claim it where, you know, sometimes you hear he warmed up and then he threw to two hitters. So he kind of almost used that kind of game day mentality. So they'll wait to throw him till after the series. But, no, yeah, you look at these pitching matchups as of now, the way they're uh, set up to be. And, yeah, if you find a way to take the first one with Chase Anderson against Peterson, then you go up. And, obviously, with the DeGrom going later because the Mets had the COVID situation, so they missed their start. So, while DeGrom is matched up against Eflin, well, you have Nola matched up there against their back half. So, that kind of favors the Phillies to go out there and win the first two or three of the series if you're able to take the Chase Anderson and Drew Peterson matchup. Yeah, especially the way they teed off on Peterson last time they faced him at the third game of that that last series, hitting the what was it two three run homers off of him. Yes, I, I yeah, believe I, uh, JT and Alec Boehm and also Reese Hoskins took him deep in that game as well. So yeah, they had a lot of success. Actually, I think uh, JT's home run was off the bullpen, but the runners on base were uh, charged to charge Peterson on that one. Um, but yeah, they had a lot of success hitting against him. And as I mentioned, they, they had success against the Mets bullpen in that series. So I think the pitching matchups in general favor the Phillies, you know, DeGrom's going to be tough, but other than that, I think that they should be favored to win the other three of those games, just based on who's on the mound there. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's, it's, it's a big series early in the season and they've had success against the Mets over the past few years. And I could see this being a series where they go in, they, they ride the momentum off a big win tonight and they get a series win up there in New York. And then after that, they come home for six games. They got three with the Cardinals and three with San Francisco. And, you know, the Cardinals are a good team, but after that, the schedule kind of lightens up a little bit. San Francisco is not that great. Colorado is not that great. So, an opportunity for the Phils to kind of gain a little bit of early breathing room and just get themselves feeling good early in the season. And I'm excited for it, man. I can't remember the last time that I was this excited <laughs> for Phil's team. It's been, it's been probably since 2011. I'll be honest with you. Uh, how do you feel like over the first nine games, there's been some ups and downs. The offense kind of was slow to come along and they had a few bumps in this Atlanta series, but overall, how are you feeling about this team after nine games? Is it any different from what you were feeling before the season started? Yeah, I think it is a little bit. I think I like how 
the teams aren't or the team excuse me, teams uh, the team uh, is not relying on one area to win games. Like you said, so far you've had games where the pitching's been bad and the offense has picked them up. The offense has picked up the pitching. The pitching has picked up the offense at times, especially that opening series. So I think again once. And obviously, it's going to happen in 162 games. You're going to have up and downs. And then also, by the midseason, you kind of expect everyone to start clicking. And once both are, st- are starting to click together, I think it's going to be a fun ride. We all know. And here's another reason why. we got a guy in charge that we can trust, too. So, like, yes. if this, assuming this team clicks at some point and you're true contenders, it's not going to be a Matt Clentac where it's like, we're praying and dying for a trade to happen. It's Dave Nebraska. We know a trade is going to happen at some point in this uh, in this season. We know we're going to go out there and get better and, and all that. So if Matt Moore and Chase Anderson are, are struggling or one of them, you, you know we're going to pick up another four starter or something like that. And I think the other thing is, to your point, why we're all excited is that, that's what a bullpen does. I, I mean, we've been sitting here for the last 10 years. I feel like, okay, well, once the starters get moved around a little bit, who's going to come in and blow the game? This year we actually can have faith in guys. And, again, it's only a nine-game sample size, but you can already tell the difference. As you mentioned earlier in the show, five of your six wins are out of the bullpen. Like, in all honesty, like, without – being funny, like we probably didn't even have ten wins last year out of the bullpen. Uh, <laughs> it's that together, yeah. So I just think that the stuff we're seeing early on is different than what we've seen last year and in years past, and that's what makes me most excited. Is I kind of expected, especially against those teams uh, in the Braves and Mets, kind of an up and down. I was expecting a little up and down trend to these games, but for the most part, I mean, yeah, outside of, I mean, outside of Friday's game, obviously got out of hand in the eighth one loss, but outside of that. I mean, every game has been enjoyable to watch pretty much and has been fun. You've been right there. Obviously, Saturday, uh, you know, you're right there. Probably should have won that one. Had a little miscue in, in the field. But I think that goes – that's what's going to happen in the early part of the season, I think, with a new pitcher, new team and everything. I think there's just a little miscommunication. And for those who I don't know what I'm referring to, there was a, a first and third situation with one out where ball went back to Jose Alvarado. He w- he turned a second to go for a double play and – uh, Gregorius, were, yeah, Gregorius and Segura weren't covering because I think they were playing in expecting him to go home so I think between Girardi, Alvarado and then the middle infield I think they just missed a sign somewhere and obviously it's what spring training is for and you don't want to see that but again he's a new pitcher on the club it's just kind of a learning experience for all of them it's something they'll take care of and move on from there but outside of that it's been a fun season and so far in these nine games and I'm excited where it can go because I think they can truly battle for this division yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, you you brought up the fielding, though, and that's one thing that I am maybe not feeling so great about. They've had some fielding miscues early on in the season. Adam Hazley had a big one. You mentioned the big one that they had last night. Um, Boom, Boom's made some incredible plays, but he's also made a few errors out there. So it, it has been terrible, but there's definitely room to improve defensively. So, you know, the season's young. Obviously, there's a lot of time to get that fixed, though. Uh, if like I like I said before, if they could just really fix up that issue in center field, I think that's the biggest thing. I think they'll be all right defensively. But yeah, it's it's been exciting. You know, it's it's just it's so nice to know that they've got the backbone that they need in the bullpen, the guys who can finish off a game that they didn't have last season. You know, in a game like tonight. Uh, I would be a hundred per last season. I would have been a hundred percent certain, a hundred and ten percent certain that they're going to lose the game on like a walk off grand slam or something like that. You know, if you're taking the seven, six lead, I was uh, last season. I would have been a hundred percent certain that, you know, Hector Neres walks the first guy and then Acuna comes up and hits a 450 foot moonshot <laughs> to win it for, uh, for Atlanta. But especially the series you, he had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's about time they got him out in the big situation. <laughs> But, um, yeah, the way things are going this year, you know, I'm confident in the bullpen. Uh, one one run lead doesn't feel like it's somehow less than a one run lead. Um, you know, it's, the confidence level as a fan is just so much higher in this bullpen than it's it's been in years past. And I think that that's going to go a long way for this team because last season, let's be honest, it was a difference between uh, having a losing record like they did and would probably should have been a playoff team. And I think that if they can, if the bullpen can keep pitching the way that they've been this season, then yeah, I think they are a playoff team. Um, but yeah, you have, uh, Andrew, you have any final thoughts that you want to throw in here before we wrap this one up? 
No, I, I just agree with your last point is the last thing I have. And, and to go off that, a big thing is, you know, they always say hitting is contagious and all that. Well, I think that goes into the bullpen as well. I mean, when you have guys throwing well, I think that gives Nairish confidence. Like, okay, these guys are actually going to get the job done this year. I'm going to get in there in that safe situation in a spot where the, the team's going to need me. And uh, I think that's something you didn't have last year's when it was like this guy gave up a run, that guy would give up a run. It would just spread out through the whole pen. And I think it does just the mentality wise. And I think, and especially in baseball, mentality is a huge part of the game. The mental aspect of it's huge. You hear it left and right all around from former players and everything. And I think that's what's going to happen, too, is you see guys getting out of situations. It, it kind of all goes well. And I think that's the whole point of the hot and uh, cold streaks and everything is because when, when one group is clicking, they all click together, it seems like. And I think that's what you're going to see out of this group. And to your point about Bradley, it's just a shame he got hurt just because he's been so much fun fan-wise, and I'm sure he'll be all over Twitter throughout his uh, IL stint, so it'll be, it'll be fun to watch him. Yeah, so hopefully that injury is just the 10 days, you know, nothing nothing beyond that. Um, I also want to touch on what you said earlier about Dave Dombrowski. You know, he's an all-in kind of guy, and you might say that, hey, the Phillies don't have a whole lot down on the farm that they can get rid of for, for a guy, but, you know, he's, he's the kind of guy he'll look at, like, a Hazley or a Moniac and see like, Hey, this guy hasn't done a whole lot at the major league level, but they still have some upside that can, that we can sell some teams on and maybe get a good return in, in exchange for one of those two guys, or, you know, take the, one of the few pieces that they do have down on the farm and turn that into a key player uh, in exchange for a key player to make a run here. So yeah, it's a big difference between having Dombrowski and having Matt Klintak, who was, seemingly afraid to pull the trigger on those kind of deals. Um, Dombrowski, a guy who, you know, he's helped teams win World Series before. And yes, he has a tendency to deplete the farm system. But first off, the Phillies don't really have a farm system to deplete, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. But yeah, he, he does that and, and ends up working out well for these teams because, you know, they go and they have the success that they're expected to have. They go out and they compete for championships. And, you know, it, it's win now here, and I think Dave Dombrowski is the right guy to have in a win now situation. So I'm happy that the Phillies were able to make that change, and I think that's going to prove to pay huge dividends um, this season and, and in your future as well. And I also want to give a shout out real quick to Just Food. If you're looking for something to eat during the Phillies game, you know you're looking to grab a bite somewhere. Just Food is a great option. You can find them by phone at 215-794-3663. It's 215-794-FOOD. Located in Buckingham Green in Buckingham, Pennsylvania. Their owner, Asian Rob, a great friend of the Always Next Year Podcast Network. Once again, Just Food, 215-794-3663. Have an excellent menu. You will not find anything that you don't like on there. Just check them out. They're awesome. We thank you for listening to this episode of the Chase and the Pennant Podcast. We'll be back with another one in just a few days. But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me, I'll throw me caution all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again. He cracked open a rib or two, he beat me suddenly through and through, and so jig over my unconscious frame. Dumb and lame.